Welcome to Amsterdam and KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023. Join John Furrier, Savannah Peterson, Rob Strecce, and Yu Pizka as the Cube covers the largest conference on Kubernetes, cloud native, and open source technologies together with developers, engineers, and IT leaders from around the globe. Live coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2023 is made possible by the support of Red Hat, the CNCF, and its ecosystem partners. Hello, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage here in Amsterdam for KubeCon EU 2023 CloudNativeCon. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We've got a great AI panel here. We're going to try to break down what's going on in DevSecOps, DevOps, Cloud Native. AI is the hottest trend on the planet. Of course, machine learning's been around for a while. Most of the companies have been implementing machine learning in data centers, the cloud, and pretty much everywhere else. So AI is the hot <laughs> trend. We've got a great lineup here. Lewis Ryan, CTO of Solo.io, is here. Brian Gracie, head of marketing of Solo.io, and Saad Malik, co-founder and CTO of Spectral Cloud. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having yeah, us here. Yeah. Having us. So the number one hallway talk is kind of two things. VMs moving to cloud native, that's been going on for a while, so old technology coming into cloud native, check, check, check. Of course, developer productivity, but AI, chat GPT. I've heard a startup tell me their VCs and investors want to know what their chat GPT strategy is. <laughs> like, whatever that means. <laughs> What's, so AI's hot, but everyone has to have a hot take, but there is some impact, so we're going to try to explore that. So you guys got on the service mess side, it's a lot going on. Cost optimization, cloud, a lot of things happening in the plumbing, middle layers, services. So I think it's a ripe, automation smells like AI to me. So like, let's get into it, but before we start, give a little background on Solo.io and what you guys do. We'll start with you guys. Yeah, sure, so uh, Solo.io is the leading um, cloud native application networking platform. We've been on before, love talking to you guys. Uh, we're really excited, Louis Ryan, who's the inventor of, of Istio, just joined us as our CTO, so a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, we just announced a multi-cloud uh, solution this week, on Monday at our application networking day, so, you know, this show's huge, it's, it's, it's hot, and we've got a lot going on too, so. Give a quick plug on Istio, where it started, what does it mean, How, what's it turned into? So, I mean, Istio is a, a service mesh technology that was kind of really born out of trying to help enterprises improve their posture with security, observability, networking, and controls. Uh, you know, founded on the, the basic principles of zero trust, baking that in from the very beginning, and then starting to build on top of that to really help enterprises, uh, you know, secure, you know, achieve a better security posture than what they were used to with mm -hmm. typical boundary controls and edge networks and solutions like that. A lot of services. Spectra Cloud, what do you guys do? So we're a modern Kubernetes management platform. We help our customers to deploy and manage Kubernetes at scale, whether it's in their public environments, private data centers, and edge environments. We take a declarative approach to being able to manage everything from your operating system, your Kubernetes, and all the integrations, which would include service mesh and the layers above Got that. It. And so obviously the big trend with cloud is basically distributed computing. Edge is hot. It's not hot. The role of data is huge, but you know, we were just talking on another panel around the developer angle on that is that developers don't decide where the data is stored. Someone else does, database person, infrastructure person. So if data becomes important, how does AI implement, who implements AI? The developer, is it the infrastructure, or both? How do you guys see AI coming in? I mean, not that everyone has a clear answer right now, but if you can almost connect some dots. What do you guys see AI fitting in? When we say AI, we see the, the generative AI, modern, uh, the foundation right. models that are hot right now. I mean, obviously large language models, is, data with language, but it's multimodal, they got computer vision, the data from machines, there's a ton of IOT data, so data generally is the yeah. piece. What do you guys think? I, I mean, for us, and this is the interesting thing about like this moment in time, so up until now, you know, data, like you said, was data was sort of the domain of of the groups that manage data. So it could have been uh, you know, monitoring tools and, and APM tools and storage companies and so forth. Then all of a sudden, and, and again, you, you, as, like you said, as a developer, you were like, well, that's, I'm kind of hands off from it, I go and access it. Now, AI has sort of put that back in power in everybody's hands. So all of a sudden, you have all these things that maybe you didn't think about before, uh, it, just like simple things, right? So, I can now plug in uh, AI to like my documentation. So if I'm the guy administering service mesh for an example, I've essentially got like a, an expert sitting on my shoulder all the time that I didn't necessarily have before. Yeah. Or if I want to be able to look at logs and be like, you know, what, what can I do with that? I used to have to go to a, an expensive tool like Datadog or something else. Now I potentially can you know, leverage those sort of things. So it's, the data's still its own domain, but I think the ability to give people self-service or more, you know, 
more access it to themselves becomes really interesting. And I think we're at, right at the tip of the iceberg of that. What do you think? I think I, I agree with them for sure. I think one aspect before, data used to be a lot more structured. You'd have to be able to define, hey, this is what I need to send up in terms of my log or my metrics or my information. Now with AI technologies, you're able to look at any unstructured data and actually make meaningful re resemblances out of it, whether it's in terms of traffic patterns or usages, and make recommendations and correlations from that. It becomes much more useful even going back in time and reading all the data back into your platforms now. Louis, when I remember Istio came on the scene, one thing I was intrigued by was this lot of service being stood up, torn down, mm -hmm. on the fly kind of thing, which, which, you know, okay, that makes sense. A lot of things are happening. Logging was important, remember now is observability is a whole category. I mean, AI, you see a lot of code being generated from the chat GPT kind mm -hmm. of trend, foundational mm -hmm. model. So you see coding, which we're calling code pollution, potentially. <laughs> you have, if bad code comes in, who's going to watch the code? It's going to change observability, so I see that as a factor. Yeah. But yes. Also just automation and efficiency, like something's going to break before it gets fixed. Maybe that's my opinion, I don't know. But what do you think? What's your take on all this? So I mean, I, th I think you're going to see a lot of focus on some like really high value areas within the enterprise. Um, you know, there's obviously things that break and have no real consequences, and then there are things that break and have vastly dangerous consequences to an enterprise and its business. Um, so I think you'll see a large focus on pulling in all these diverse signals and producing assessments about security, yeah. right, from these diverse signals, because it's all this unstructured data. Um, and, but there are aggregate signals in there about what's actually going on yeah. inside your, your infrastructure, your network traffic, the, the traffic you have with partners, and with all these other you know, different agents in the system. And so anything that helps you synthesize from all those signals quickly and respond to them quickly is going to be immensely valuable, right? Because we live in an age of ongoing threats and we've seen the damage that these threats have. On the on security on side, it's massive. Yeah. What's the, where is the AI land first? I mean, I, I mean innovations can be messy sautés a little bit, meanders around. I think, I see that kind of happen, but it's got to land somewhere where the, it starts hitting practical use cases that's the low-hanging fruit. Oh, yeah. Where's the low-hanging fruit for you guys? So, you I mean, see we've that? seen, like, uh, you know, already we're starting to see, like, basic operational tools, like, you know, read all the Kubernetes docs, like, do all the, the tailoring, the training, the, the prompt engineering, so you have a Kubernetes SRE, like, sitting on your shoulder, talking in your ear. Um, mm -hmm. You know, hopefully somebody will call one of those a parrot at some point. Um, so I think you'll see, you know, uh, organizing institutional knowledge and making it available, whether it's you know as an external tool, or also you'll see it in, inside the enterprise, uh, you know, like for a company like us, for like a field engineering team, right, where we have our own internal best practices, yeah. our own internal engineering, and so enabling them to be more effective in customer engagements and time to solution. I think you're going to see yeah. that be quite valuable. Yeah, Brian, you talked about the last time in Detroit, you talked about workflows, how you guys engineer success for your customers. At some yeah. point, you can step away and maybe make that automated or cost recovery, cost maintain, cost optimization. These are kind of like institutional data points. Those seem to be like the easy ones. Yeah, yeah I mean, stuff like, like we, you know, we, we run a Slack channel for every single customer that comes into ours. We'll have customers that are international, but maybe the account team is in San Francisco, right? They don't want to be up at two in the morning. We can we can drop a we can drop a, a Slack bot in there. They can figure out sentiment. Is this is this customer upset? Do I need to wake somebody up? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean there's yeah there's a ton of low hanging fruit. I, I guarantee somebody's going to walk around, look at all these booths, take the the messaging from it, and go figure out how do I differ even dif differentiating marketing in this yeah. you know crazy crowded environment. Someone so, might even write a summary of the <laughs> blog post of all yeah. the conversations we're having on the yeah, cube. Yeah. I mean, what's your take on all yeah, this? Yeah, no, I think it's interesting. I think the, uh, the cool thing about the AI, is, like, especially large language models, is being able to take all the public domain knowledge about the different parameters, what is the sentiment, what is it like, what is the actual subject about, and then being able to apply maybe 20% of that with your own institutional knowledge, right. whether it's your Slack channels, your support, or other things, essentially making your own. Hey, even though this is how you read an actual sentiment for whether somebody's liking it, yeah. but specifically with an Istio or Google or whatever, this is how it specifically it means for this customer. Yeah, so. and there's no doubt there's going to be more services, more activity. The question I want to ask you guys next is, if you look at the, the papers coming out, which by the way has been incredible, I've read more academic papers in the past three <laughs> months than I have in the past 30 years, okay? And they're pretty compelling. One I just was reading last night, yeah. that shows you how, how kind of lame I am, but uh, nerdy I am, but um, I was actually at the bar watching these, uh, but it's on, it was on prompt tuning. Now remember, prompt engineering is the buzzword of the, yeah. of the year. Prompt, tune, prompt engineering is chat GPT, you give it a prompt, it spits out an answer, right. like a query, data, feeding data, 
but tuning was more about when you're not around. Tuning it, that sounds a lot like self-healing networks or concepts like that. Is that where it goes? I mean, is that, I mean, where's the data for that? So I guess it's a data challenge. Domain yeah. knowledge that you have, mm -hmm. that's locked, you can lock in on. And then what data comes in? So machines throw off data. How do you guys see that tuning piece? I'm sure Istio and, and Service Mesh is big, and on your side too. What's the, what's the take? Right, so you, you, you're trying to establish a corpus information and then you know, direct a model to be focused on solving the problems in that domain. Right, and you know, prompt engineering is really a constraint on how the interaction is going to occur between you, the mo you and the model. Tuning is a bit more about like how do I get it to more generally focus on a specific yeah. domain of expertise, right? And you know, obviously, you know, ChatGPT and the models have been trained on corpuses you know, yeah. that are stale at some point, right? Because yeah. our industry moves extremely quickly, and they're training on you know uh, internet data from two years ago <laughs> or twelve months ago, the or eighteen months web. ago. <laughs> and so, to kind of keep up with product velocity, right? You need to be able to do these types of things to be able to keep up with the, our institutional knowledge, you know, the iteration in the product, and be valuable in that domain. Uh, and so I think that's where you're going to see a lot but isn't of that what we're already doing? Kind of, or no? Yeah. I mean, in a way, it's not training, for some, but there's data collection. Yeah. I mean. Well, to your, to your point of the, the prompt training, I mean, the prompt training is really just experimentation, right? Just rapid experimentation. We already do that with applications today, right? We do A-B testing and so forth. Yeah. We just may start seeing people be able to do, instead of you know, a couple of deploys, like hundreds of those, yeah. and then you know, have something else tell you how much, you know, small fractions here, small fractions there. And you know, for big industries, whether it's like ad serving or video streaming or whatever it is, those will be very expensive or very cost effective ways of doing stuff. So, so you are collecting the data already. I mean, we see it. You know, it, one of the most interesting things I saw this week was the like number one or number two workload that runs on Kubernetes is telemetry, right? So, as much as I want to deploy an application, I want to know about what's going on with it as it is. So, <laughs> yeah, we've we've had the data. It's just you know you, we're still applying a person to it. How much can we start to apply you know smarter, smarter. Uh, you know, decision making around it. What yeah. are you seeing out there? And on the infrastructure side, it's the same aspect, right? Being able to make more intelligent decisions without having the operator inside the picture. Before it's about like, hey, I want to be able to place my workloads or my infrastructures across different clouds, different environments. You generally set policies, you look at it, okay, let me go tweak the policies, my auto scaling groups, et cetera. I think now with AI and technologies, it's more about like, hey, how do we automate that? Maybe yeah. first couple times you still need to hint it a little bit, but over time, as it gets retraining, as it gets better at it, it's less and less human intervention to make it possible. I mean, that's the theme of cloud that I like. You brought that up, is like the human loop or the human aspect of it. All the Kubernetes that we're seeing people use for managed services is the, is the ops that the, t the company doesn't want to deal with. And they want to code or do platform stuff, yeah. and Kubernetes should just be running as like, mm -hmm. like lights, like, yeah. like utility. Yeah. That's the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Where does AI go next for the DevOps? I mean, what do you guys see it happening? I mean, that's, I guess that's the question I keep coming back to, is like, I can't see the landing spot for, for AI in DevOps. Well, I, I mean, even, even just to, to Saad's point, right? We, we've, we have this thing with DevOps where it's like the, the two groups kind of work together, but there's always this, I, I just want to write code. For example, if I'm a developer, I just want to write code, and it's like, well, we can help you deploy that, but you've got to know these three extra steps. So you're going to drift into my lane a little bit. If we can start reducing those two or three steps, right? the system gives me feedback on which cloud should I deploy this to? Which, where is this going to be most yeah, yeah. cost effective? Like Even things like that, now you get back to, you know, the system's still fast, the teams are still working together, but I don't, I don't have to get out of my lane. I can focus on what I want to focus on. That, that's the biggest feedback you're getting as these yeah. AIs become more kind of like personalized is I don't go, my work doesn't go away. I just get rid of a lot of the stuff that I didn't want to think about before. Yeah, I think, I think that's kind of where it's coming together here is that it's like what Bing, Bing's a search engine. Yeah. They have ChatGPT to help you search and find stuff. Yeah. What you're getting at is, is that you don't want to have these hallucinations on the infrastructure. <laughs> you want to have known kind of augmentation of known practices, as you yeah, said. Yeah, so I mean there are obviously AI models that are very targeted, like you've seen AI used in anomaly detection, right? You'll see AI used in scheduling, right? as I mentioned. And I think you know, starting to use AI and be able to set a higher level objective for yeah. what you want to occur for either you know, a specific application or your platform as a whole, right? At, at almost like the executive level and, yeah. and watch the system work towards that goal is actually going to be quite compelling for people. Yeah. Um, we might be a few years out <laughs> from seeing that in action, yeah. right? And there's all a bunch of forces that are going to work for and against that, I think. But uh, yeah. I think over time you'll see It's like, uh, it's like dynamic operation. policy, yeah. almost. Yeah. 
Well, you and know. you're going to, the other thing you're going to see is, and this is the same problem we always have, you know, in, in enterprise tech is like, well, where does the, where does the model live? Does, you know, am I, am I reaching back to some open AI thing or do I have to build a model and keep it localized? Yeah. How do you, you know, how do you tune that? So, I mean, there's going to be a whole governance sort of locality thing that we're going to have to work through. Yeah, um, democratization is going to be a big yeah. deal, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously we were talking a lot about chat GPT and, yeah. you know, single vendorness. Right, obviously this industry as a whole has always fought against that in kind of its you know, DNA. And so yeah, I think you'll see a lot more democracy. Make sure democracy is the right thing. Sometimes you don't yeah. want to have democracy. <laughs> <It tells us laughs> yeah. You still want it to work. <laughs> well, okay, final question for you guys. As you guys look at your jobs from your respective companies, when asked what's your AI strategy, how would you respond? T to be honest, it's going to be looking at all different aspects, right? How do we help users and customers to be able to operate at scale? And it's again, coming back to not having them perform manual operations, having them do less and less. For us, it's about being able to provide a platform where decisions, not only in terms of the workloads, infrastructure requirements, everything is automated for them as much as possible, right? So we're obviously going to go heavy into, it's not going to be chat GPT, but some aspects about that, being able to help users with that, so. And, you know, AI strategy. And given what we do, we are um, particularly security focused, right? We want to make sure that customers are able to achieve strong security postures, so we will absolutely be looking at incorporating AI and helping people observe and detect threats and, and improve their security posture in terms of how they operationalize all of their applications. Brian. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, as Louis said, security but at the center of it. I think the other two pillars are going to be automation efficiency, so cost efficiency, and then user experience. There's going to be a bunch of things we can do just to, to make their experience better. Awesome, and I should note, Brian Grace, also the podcaster from the Cloudcast. Final question for you, what's the hot podcast these days? What's, the, what's going to be on the agenda post KubeCon? What's going to be the oh, headline? Wow. Uh, we'll, I mean, we'll be covering a ton of stuff <laughs> about <laughs> this. There's so many good topics here. It's, uh, we'd we'll, we'll be talking yeah, about June and Take your solo July. IO hat off, put your, put your <laughs> podcaster hat on. What's yeah. going to be the, the headline from KubeCon this year? Um, well, I think the biggest thing is, you know, we, we were a little worried that, that the KubeCon community might be going through a, a lull. It's it's exploding. It's so bad. that's that's going to be the headline is, yeah. you know, if, if Europe is growing like this, the U.S. is going to be growing. So uh, this one's exciting. Chicago should be exciting as well. Final question for Louis to you on, on, on a service mesh. Where are we? Where does it go next? What's the current state of the market for service meshes? So service meshes, you know, it's, it's become a mature technology. It's pretty widely accepted in the enterprise now as something that people need to solve a lot of their real problems. Uh, we have a new initiative in Istio called Ambient Mesh. Uh, it really helps kind of scale out and get you the value of the service mesh faster, and so we're excited to see that you know go to production readiness as part of Istio, and obviously what we do is solo in helping customers get their hands on it. Awesome. Congratulations. And on the Kubernetes side, what's the platform looking like for you guys? What's I next? I think one of the more interesting initiatives we're seeing is we're seeing a switch back towards bare metal and we're being able to run more workers efficiently because now more and more applications are running containerized. Some of them have regulation reasons, more security reasons. They want to be able to run things on-prem. And so we're seeing awesome. a bush pack bare metal Kubernetes and Edge. So. Awesome. Guys, thanks so much for the conversation. Trying to nice break time. down the AI equation in DevOps. Obviously, a lot of data, a lot of machine learning. Still low-hanging fruit. It's going to probably be a multi-year journey to figure out what's going to happen. Uh, of course, we'll have it here covering theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. We'll be right back with more after this short break. <laughs>